Hello. Hello. Okay, so, um... Oh, da da Melo. Is it from Alexandra? Oh yeah, da Melo. Yeah. Is it is it the greeting? It right? is a greeting. Yes. Oh great. Like hi or something, right? Yeah, it, it literally means I greet you. I greet you. Ah, great. I ride back. Hi then. Okay, and I forgot what it's. Okay. Um, we're gonna wait a second for Dima to log in because she has to start the streaming. Yeah, today we're going to do verbs. Uh, <laughs> I have a lot of slides. Uh, I hope we'll, we'll go through them. Um, let's see, waiting for, let's skip it like two more minutes. Also for some more people to arrive. Ah, there's Mazin. Hi Mazin, just tell me when you have put on the stream um, to Facebook and we can uh, we can start. I'm just, I'm just gonna start, I think, since we have a lot of ground to cover today. All right, um, welcome and good evening, everyone, uh, to the fourth lecture in the Old Nubian Crash Course uh, during Nubia Fest. Uh, my name is Vincent van Gerven Uy. For those who are seeing this for the first time, the other lectures can be found on YouTube together with the slides. Just type in Old Nubian and it will probably somewhere be in, in like the first 10 hits. Um, today we're going to talk about the verb, finally. Um, the verb is um, by far the most uh, complex part of uh, Nubian grammar. Um, there is a whole bunch of suffixes that you can add to them and they do all kinds of different things. And today we'll discuss the main ones and their main uses. Um, so let's just, um, let's just get started. Um, I think I can just go and click here. There we go. So, um, the old Nubian verbal complex or verb phrase always starts with a verbal root. So you always know when you see a verb that the first part is the thing that carries the meaning. It's your lexical item. It's the thing that you find in the dictionary. It's usually one syllable, sometimes two, sometimes crazily it's three, but it's usually one or two syllables. So the things are not, you know, very large. Um, and then following that, you can have things like aspect, tense, person, a plurationality or verbal number, however you want to call it. Transitivity, negation, affirmation, there are mood suffixes, and also a sentence type. Um, Old Nubian is an SOV language. Some of you may have already seen this from the examples that I've shown, which means that the canonical structure of a sentence is subject, object, verb. Um, and so usually the verb is at the end of your sentence. Um, not necessarily because a lot of times things are mixed up and things are not where they are supposed to be, uh, so be it. But underlyingly, it is thought that uh, Old Nubian is a subject of the verb, or at least it seems to behave like a language that has that main order. So let's first start looking at um, tense and uh, aspect. So we find Old Nubian in a rather exciting moment of linguistic development in the sense that um, it is clear that in Old Nubian's past, 
there was a, a, a clear distinction between tense markers uh, and aspectual markers, um, with tense being uh, signaled by a, a consonant, uh, a consonantal distinction that you can see here in this little table between L and S, and that there seems to have been an aspectual distinction, at least between zero and, and E, and maybe also a back vowel. Um, and as you can see, this has resulted in five different, let's say, combined tense aspect morphemes that we see in uh, contemporary, in like in not present day Old Nubian, in Old Nubian as we find it in our, in our literary and documentary texts. Um, the sixth option, so the combination between O and Omicron and Sigma, between O and S, it has not been attested. And we don't know whether this was possible or maybe this whole form is an innovation. Um, we don't know. What we do know is that, let's say, the, um, um, that this, let's say, rather complex system of different things attaching to each other and then having these conjoined types of you know, complex meanings um, became simplified over time until we arrive at the current Nubian languages. So when we look, for example, at uh, Andandi or we look at Nobin, um, they only have one past tense rather than uh, two past tenses, for example. And they no longer have an aspectual distinction between you know, a present imperfective and a, a present perfective. Um, so, so what we see is that over, we have before, before Old Nubian, let's say pre-Old Nubian, we have a clearly distinguished tense aspect system with consonants and vowels encoding these. And we end up in current Nubian languages with like a seemingly a fused system that is purely oriented towards tense and where aspect is regulated with a bunch of other suffixes. And so Old Nubian is somewhere in that transition period. And that makes it for really fascinating material because um, looking at the tense system and the tense aspect system and how it develops gives us something of a relative chronology of the texts as well. So for example, since we know that the perfective aspect marked with this epsilon disappeared over time, we again can look at text and say, well, this text has a lot of them. Uh, so it's, it may be an earlier text and this one doesn't have them at all. So maybe this is a later text. So again, linguistic development can give us a sense of chronology, especially since we have so few other things that tell us stuff about the chronology of texts, except for uh, the archeology. span uh, in which they are found, the archaeological context. Um, by the way, again, as in previous uh, lectures, if you have questions, you can put them in the chat. And when I see them, I, I'll try to answer them. And also through Facebook, I'm sure you can ask them there. And then mysteriously, I will, I will be informed that Facebook has a question. Um, but to come back to this table, um, these are the, let's say, five different ways in which uh, Old Nubian encodes tense and aspect originally. There are a lot of other suffixes that start doing similar things, and we'll get to those as well. But this seems to be like, let's say, the original matrix. Um, now, let's say, yes, your fairies will tell you. Oh yeah, 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 my fairies. Yes, the, the fairies will tell the fairy. Um, so um, what we see, um, what we see uh, with these tense morphemes is that they start fusing with person marking, person marking that we saw yesterday, and that in turn with um, the predicate marker. So that's why I gave these types of paradigm tables Usually I don't like to give those because they suggest that they are paradigms and I don't believe in paradigms in Old Nubian in the sense that it's simply suffixes that follow each other. Um, but because we start to see like fusional effects, namely things merging into a single morpheme, um, which for example, in current Nobin or Andandi has been, you know, led to fully fused tense aspects person uh, morphemes that, you know, you really cannot, you know, split apart anymore. Um, I give these little lists. This is, of course, an idealized representation. There is a lot of variety out there in the real texts. 
Uh, but this gives you a sense of how these uh, tense aspect morphemes and person morphemes and the predicate marker uh, A uh, all interact, right? So you see that here we have um, a, a verbal root ankh to think or to remember um, with only a tense marking. There are certain contexts in which this is a to totally fine verbal form. Um, and then as soon as we start adding these uh, person clitics, these subject clitics, we see uh, the L changes to R. This is a very common uh, thing. Intervocalic L becomes R. Um, once you then add uh, an alpha, then these vowels start merging. So E plus A usually becomes A. Um, here we see when you add the N, the uh, it, it assimilates completely to the to the tense uh, marker and so on. Right. So there are all these funky little things happening on the edges between the morphemes. Um, so this is your present imperfective. Um, the E that you see here again is the same one that we discussed um, the other time. Uh, it is there because you simply cannot have a cluster of three consonants uh, one after the other. So this is an epithetical vowel. It's a, it's a phonological effect. Um, when we go to the present perfective, um, we consistently find this epsilon here. Um, otherwise, the endings are the same. Um, Alexandros asks, why not a superlinear instead? Yes, Alexandros, you can put a superlinear if you want. It really doesn't matter. I just wrote no superlinear so that everybody can clearly see that there's a yota here rather than struggling with a superlinear. Like, it's simply an idealization so that people in an educational context understand what the fuck is going on. Um, so here we um, see consistently an epsilon. Uh, nothing very special about it. Otherwise, all the endings more or less the same. Um, and then let's talk about the disappearance of this epsilon. So um, over time, this epsilon um, that used to indicate, or at least in my interpretation, and this is my interpretation, uh, used to indicate perfective aspect, um, became weakened and was probably reinterpreted as just another variant of the imperfective, uh, which usually has this, this yota. Um, as that distinction between perfective and imperfective vowel starts to fade, we see at the same time the disappearance of a bunch of new suffixes that then help us to indicate perfectiveness. Again, this is not something that is very strange, you know, when one distinction that is needed in a language, you know, phonologically starts disappearing, the language st starts inventing other ways or speakers of that language start to invent other ways to make that distinction, but in a new way. Uh, and that's exactly what we see with the marking of perfective in, uh, in Old Nubian. So here we have, this is very nice because we have two sentences that are probably translated from or probably related to the same Greek sentence, but translated at different points in time. Um, it's from uh, the hymn of the cross uh, that Alexandros and I have been working on over the last, I don't know, more than a year, two years. I don't know how long have we been looking at this stupid thing uh, in all its different variants. Um, but in any case, we have here uh, what we assume to be an earlier translation from uh, the Psyche Chrysostomos text, um, where we have the cross is the healer of the sick. Um, to be sick is uh, uh, in itself already a completed verb, right? If you're sick, you're sick. It's 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 it, you have you you have become sick and then you are sick. So it's it is a perfective thing in itself in terms of its aspect. Um, and we see very nice in this earlier translation uh, the use of perfective present. Um, in a later translation or a later rendering of this sentence, um, we see that this perfective is no longer there and we, we are, we are uh, dealing with a simple present or like, let's say, implied imperfective. Yeah. Um, another fun thing is, is that in this older translation, you see that they use what seems to be a native Nubian word for doctor. Um, but in the later translation, we have a Greek loan word. Yeah, so this is also kind of interesting. Like, why why did they chose one and why not the other? This is an open an open question, right? So you see here very nicely that for the same word, for the same sentence, uh, the same context, even uh, the same hymn, 
uh, we find these two different uh, uh, morphemes and the only thing that uh, distinguishes them is the time frame in which the, these were produced. Um, one context, however, in which these perfective morphemes seem to persist uh, is the context of divine actions, which I think is really fascinating. And I don't know any other example. Um, and, and of course, when I talk about divine actions, this is kind of a generalization that I made, but it seems that the, this epsilon for perfective persists mainly in the realm of divine beings doing things. Um, this also kind of makes sense because like when God something, it is by definition, perfect, finished and done. Like he is not, you know, he is not working on his crochet work on a daily basis and it's not finished, right? The man starts a crochet work and is done. Uh, that's, that's kind of what makes him a Godhead. So um, uh, 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 when Jesus or God is doing things, it usually is with this uh, uh, perfective marker, even in, in rather late text. So for example, in the Star Wars text, uh, um, we saw earlier, just the previous slide, that it had lost already this perfective aspect marker in one context. But when we're talking about um, uh, uh, God sitting upon his throne, uh, judging the whole world, this judging is definitive, right? This is a perfective thing, it's done you know, like uh, 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 the library is open and closed. So, so you know, this is, uh, <laughs> this is a done deal. Uh, and it, it's really not quite interesting that, that only in this specific semantic context that, that that type of morphology has been retained, not only in this text, but also in many other texts. Um, And Alexander says, this is very interesting for issues of divine providence in human history. It is very interesting. Uh, and, and I would be delighted to have other examples from other languages that treat divinities uh, differently as regards the aspect of their actions. I, I, you know, I have no other examples that I can think of. And it would be really, I mean, it would just be very interesting to see if other languages do something like this, because I have not seen this uh, elsewhere. Um, then let's go to the past tense. The past tense in Old Nubian is also confusing because there are two, past one and past two. Um, we have no understanding of their semantic distinction. They seem by all means and purposes to mean exactly the same thing. Um, I, all the propositions that have been made in the past, uh, I don't think are valid in terms of semantic distinction. They don't hold up to the actual evidence. And the problem is, is that modern Nubian languages have not retained this distinction either. So when we look at Nubian, we see that the past one and past two uh, suffixes have kind of merged into this uh, combined past tense. Um, and, and Andandi simply doesn't have past two at all. It has an innovative past that is, that is related to what in, uh, in Old Nubian seems to be a perfect tense. And if we look at something like Midob, they don't have past one analogs, but they do have past two. So, so we don't really know what's going on. Um, different mod modern day Nubian languages have, uh, uh, have gotten rid of this dual, dual, dual paradigm and only retained one or a combination of both. And so it's difficult to understand exactly what the distinction was. Um, past one is uh, characterized by a back vowel. So O, A, or U. Again, we see a bunch of uh, 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 fusion uh, going on on these edges here and here with the vowels. Um, also, sometimes these back vowels can change a little bit. Sometimes this is also an ah. Um, not very often, this seems to be the general pattern. Pass two is characterized by a sigma, uh, by an S sound. Uh, it's always very recognizable. Um, and uh, as you can see here, no um, assimilation is happening, right? The sigma is just there always. Uh, in fact, the sigma usually leads to assimilation effects uh, elsewhere, uh, as we will see maybe in some of the examples. So there is no semantic distinction between past one and two, but there is a syntactic distinction, which is also kind of funny. So, um, for example, past only the past two is used with 
negative suffixes. Actually, there are a few examples of past one in a negative context, but it's with an auxiliary for unknown reasons. Um, past to two uh, is the only past that can be used in combination with an intentional suffix. So this is a type of a modal suffix, which uh, or a special suffix that tells you something that something's going to happen in the future. And 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 when you want to say that in the past, so to to create some type of irrealis, then you can only use past two suffix. Um, there is a distinction between the uses of past one and past two depending. Uh, on whether your attributive relative clause is co-referential or non-co-referential. I think this is completely wild. So like um, when you have a relative clause, we, we discussed relative clause, I think yesterday or the day before, um, in which the subject is co-referential with the antecedent, um, right? Something like um, um, the book that is really nice. Um, then you use a past one. Um, but if the uh, uh, if the relative clause is non-coreferential, namely that the antecedent is the same as the object of uh, of the main ver of the verb in the relative clause, such as uh, the book that John bought, then we have a past two. Why we don't know. Um, then there seems to be another correlation, namely that the past two always appears with a subject clitic. So there are no environments in which, or there are hardly any environments in which you will find a form like this. So a pass to with a predicate marker, but with no subject clitic. It's very rare. Um, there are actually a few environments in which these, these, these forms occur, namely in, in certain types of relative, relative clauses, but, but they're not very frequent. And so again, we don't know why this correlation exists. Um, again, anyone with um, uh, clues about other languages that have tense distinctions that have no semantic difference, but a syntactic difference, I would be very grateful if anyone can tell me. Uh, now or in the future YouTube comments under this video once I upload it. Um, so uh, as I said, this distinction between perfective and imperfective uh, 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 between E and E disappeared over time. And so we see uh, parallel to that, the appearance of new morphemes uh, indicating that the aspect is perfective. And these are the suffixes os and et. Uh, and these are clearly related to verbs. Uh, they both basically mean to take. Um, and they become incorporated into the uh, verbal complex, probably starts out as some type of converb construction, and then the things are kind of like merged. Um, and, and we see this very nicely with one specific verb, um, which is the verb owl to save. And what is nice about this verb is that usually the person who's doing the saving is a divine figure, right? It's like God saving the human beings or stuff like that. Jesus, Jesus saves uh, a bunch of people. And so uh, quite frequently we see, um, we see uh, a combination between this verbal root and L or like this E eh of a perfective uh, present tense. Um, we then see also this other new innovative suffix creeping in. So you have forms like aulos, 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 e. Eh. And finally, you have a bunch of forms in which you have lost your, uh, um, um, here it is, you have lost your perfective marker, e, eh, but you have, you know, you retain your innovative, your new uh, uh, suffix uh, for perfective. And uh, this is also the suffix that has survived in no being, for example, as a marker of, of completed actions. Um, it appears that the selection of whether you use os or et is lexically determined. Um, I have also been told uh, by no being speakers that in certain contexts they also contribute to a change in the meaning of the verb, or they can in indicate politeness, or there are all kinds of secondary effects of the usage of the suffixes in, in, in contemporary Nubian that suggests that maybe also in Old Nubian, um, this uh, suffix was doing more than simply indicate uh, perfectiveness. Um, but this is, this is difficult to, uh, to reconstruct. Uh, what exactly it meant, but we know it was le lexically selected. And so there is one verb in which this has actually led to quite significant 
uh, changes in meaning, namely with the verb jan, which means basically to exchange for money or like in a in an maybe for money is not the right word, but to exchange in an economical context. Um, and um, with os, it means to uh, sell, but with et or it, it means to, uh, the, 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 the translation got lost here, it means to buy. And so like there is this uh, quite strong distinction between uh, uh, the, the, the meaning of the two suffixes. So it here says, keep the new grain, but let them sell uh, 47 artops of his old grain. And here it says, um, uh, please uh, um, um, buy uh, his share. Um, what is it again? Buy, we have his share. And then we have his hairs. His hairs bought his share, something like this. Um, then we have another thing that does something in terms of perspective, per, perspective um, namely a particle of which we have precisely three attestations, uh, the particle ta, uh, which we call a particle because we simply don't know what it is and therefore we call it particle, um, uh, uh, which seems also to indicate perfectiveness. Um, uh, it, it occurred, it occurs three times and all three times it's translation from Greek. Um, and um, we don't know exactly what it does and where it comes from, um, but we do know that it co-occurs with, uh, uh, it occurs in translations in which the Greek has an aorist or perfect tense verb. Uh, so we call it a perfective particle. Um, not much to say about it otherwise. Anyone who has any idea about what this thing is or where it comes from, because, you know, Old Nubian doesn't have a shitload of particles, nor does it have any verbal prefixes, right? And this seems to function a little bit like a prefix. Um, we don't know. The fact that it is a prefix, however, suggests that it's old, um, because we do know that let's say in a pre-Old Nubian stage, there were a bunch of verbal prefixes uh, that, were, that were functioning. There is a prefix M for negation. Um, for example, you have the, the, the couple uh, on to love and moon to hate. Um, you have uh, ir, uh, it's to, uh, to, to bear, to be pregnant, and mir is to, uh, to be barren, to be, uh, uh, um, how do you say this? Unable to, uh, to bear a child um infertile so we know that that thing is there and then recently uh angelica jacobi also proposed that there is a prefix u which seems to be an old causative uh, and so there are all kinds of you know uh, let's say couples of of um of uh, verbs like suk and uskir um that seem to be etymologically related and one of one is the causative of the other um so maybe this ta is also something that's old, um, but we don't know. Uh, we don't, we, there's nothing else in any other Nubian language that I've been able to find that looks like it. Then um, we have an intentional. Uh, an intentional is actually usually used for translating stuff in Greek that is in the future tense. So something that happens into the future, but it's not a tense in the sense of a Greek future tense. It really indicates an intention for the action to happen in the future. And so that means that you can also use it in a context like this sentence. Uh, the woman found a boat ready to go to Vloxenite and said to the boatman. So um, a boat ready to go is basically this, this verb right here, which has this intentional suffix. So, right, it's not the woman found a boat that will go um because this is this is this is not necessarily implied it's it's implied that you know there is a boat that has all the aspects of going in the future which is i suppose it's not very different from a boat that will go but i feel a boat that is ready to go um oh well also because there is a word ready here 
uh, seems to make a bit more sense, right? So like in English, you wouldn't be able to say found a boat ready to will go, which probably would be like a more literal translation, right? So there's just this future intention. All right. Um, we have an habitual uh, in K, um, still exists in, uh, in present day Nubian languages, indicates a, a, a habitual action. Uh, it nearly always occurs with the present tense. Um, all these things he's sitting upon, uh, sitting, uh, sitting upon the mountain. Uh, we, we still talk about a god here who's sitting on, upon the mountain and is surveying the entire world and ships going under in, in terrible storms. Um, and so he is, um, he is seeing that habitually. So he's seeing that all the time or he's seeing that on a daily basis or like he is, it's his hobby to look down at the world and see people go under in terrible storms as gods do. Um, all right, so um, let's have a look at, um, oh, Alexandros is writing me another question on Signal. Alexandros, just please choose one, one single platform. Like I'm getting so confused. Um, yesterday we discussed that possessive suffixes are the result of lexicalization, not ancient, but recent. There is nothing indicating that the explanation of ta can be found in this direction. Um, well, when we talk about lexicalization, um, when we look at these possessor suffixes, it is very clear what they come from, right? So we had these, these things like apple or inak, um, where we have this possessor prefix and that slowly merges with your noun, you know, because when you say uncle, you have to say who's uncle. Um, Alexander, you really should stop typing in signal. It's like terribly confusing for me because I see a gazillion window. So you really should stop doing this. <laughs> All your questions are for the public if they're in this lecture. I'm not, I'm just not continuing this way at all. Like you ask your question publicly or you ask it later, like privately, but not while I'm actually trying to explain something. Like, please. Uh, <laughs> Bound Thank you, Solange. Boundaries. That's precisely what this is about. It's about boundaries. Um, so, so going back to these um, uh, 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 possessive prefixes, we can we can see where these prefixes come from, right? So, when we see that there is this ah, then we're like, oh, it's really quite similar to this personal pronoun, and you know, it probably is something that merged, and we can see from what it merged. In the case of this ta. We don't even know to start where to think what this thing could have been. Like there is no, there's, there's not something that is logical that would, um, that would be the origin of this particle. Like the only thing, now that I'm thinking about it, the only thing that I can think about would be like a converb from Tara to, to come or something. But why would that, why would that be a logical thing to turn into a verbal prefix? Because the same converb also becomes a postposition in some context, which is much more logical development. So like, yes, of course we can think in a direction is like, you know, this may be lexicalized, but then from what? And the question is from what? What, what is it here? And not only what is it here, why is it having this type of meaning? Yes. So it is doing something that, and it's doing something as a prefix that we just don't expect anything to do. Nothing in Old Nubian is like it. Yeah, this is the problem. Um, if we find something that's like it, we might be understanding a little bit more about it, but we, we haven't. Um, so that's, that's how it is. Um, you see, you're, you're making me late, man. Um, right, so, Affirmation and negation. So these seem to be related things that you can do with a verb. You can either really affirm a verb or you can negate a verb. Now negation is something that we can also do in English. We use the word not. Affirmation is something you cannot do really in English unless it is probably, you know, italicizing it or underlining it or putting like, I don't know, a gazillion emojis behind it. Um, and in Old Nubian, you do this, you can do this in two different ways. Um, you can either do this by um, 
uh, using this uh, suffix im. Uh, again, this is an idealized list, right? The, the actual way it appears in text is sometimes a bit different. You can use this m, uh, which is quite recognizable and you see that the present tense suffix also assimilates to it. Um, but you can only do that for the first and third singular because for the second singular and second plural, you have other forms um, that we discussed yesterday. Namely, they use these old subject suffixes. So we have this really weird suppletive paradigm where for the first and the third, you have this M suffix, but then for the second, you have these old subject suffixes and a completely different structure of your verb. Um, it's like stuff that maybe Georgian would do or something. Um, so here we have um, a, let's say a, a standard affirmative verb form. Uh, I rejoice and with all of you, I rejoice. Uh, he clearly is rejoicing a lot. Um, and what is really nice about these uh, verb forms that have this affirmative suffix is that they appear in verb second position. Now, verb second position is basically the first position after your topic. So if you don't have topic, then it is at the beginning of the clause. And what is really nice about this, especially for a Nubian translator who wants to be really close to the Greek, uh, is that um, if you have your SOV structure and your verb is at the end, I don't, I don't know if this is logic, logic, logical for you as the end, but that's, I mean, I cannot, maybe this is the end. Anyhow, let's say that this is the end of the sentence. What, what this affirmative uh, suffix allows you to do is to move the verb whoop, right to the beginning. Uh, and that's really useful because the word order in Greek is really different from the word order in Old Nubian. So you need ways to move shit around. And so this is one of the ways that Nubian scribes use to move shit around. Um, and they do it, you know, with a lot of pleasure, uh, I, I imagine. So here we see this uh, form right here. Um, it, by the way, it also appears in, in certain contexts, like for example, in, in greetings and formulaic, like I greet you, I thank you, you know, I worship you, that sort of thing. And also very nicely, it appears uh, frequently in the apodosis of conditional clauses. And so the apodosis is a luxury word for um, if this, then that. And so the then that, that's your apodosis. And it's like your big conclusion, like if you do this, uh, you will be shot. Then the, you will be shot as if this is your apodosis. And so for that, you will, you know, you can use, not always, but it is frequent that uh, affirmative verb is used. So to really drive the point home, let's say. Um, so as I said, for the second persons, um, we find a completely different ordering of uh, our uh, uh, verb. So here we have a present tense suffix, a predicate marker, and then, uh, and then the present tense marker, which is completely crazy. Like that's not at all where it should be, but there it is. Um, and then um, your old suffix marker. So this, this, these two markers that seem to be kind of uh, fossils from a previous uh, stage of the language. Um, and what is really nice is that, that we have all these forms attested. So with present tense and with past tense, but you see that the Nubian scribes that were writing these forms already, you know, after maybe the initial phase of the language start forgetting like that this is, that this is a past tense marker. And this is not really, you know, surprising because this thing is supposed to be somewhere here. It's not supposed to be here. What is it doing here? So obviously, you know, considering the fact also that these forms are not very frequent, this starts to become fossilized, you know, people start messing up their consonants and at some point they're just, you know, we're not even gonna deal with this anymore. Like we, we, we completely forget about this distinction about present and past tense affirmative verb forms. Because moreover, um, as you can see here, for first and third, not even a, a past affirmative form exists at all. It's, it's by definition present tense. So, so it is not strange that this distinction is lost rapidly uh, through the course of the development of the language. Um, here we have a nice one. You have done the deed of your son. I'm sorry that this is such a <laughs> like elliptic sentence, but that's how it appears in the text. Um, and we see very nicely here this affirmative verb form, awarasi. 
Um, note also that different from affirmative verbs with M, this guy appears where it is supposed to appear at the end of the clause, right? So apparently this one can't move. Also, you know, interesting, I would say. And, and by the way, here is, uh, uh, Solange here is like a real life example of these uh, possessive prefixes, right? Your son. Yeah. So this is one of the, one of the few examples uh, that we have in the, in the corpus. Um, negation also contains an M, but then also usually an N. So this, uh, so min or men is used for negation. Um, as I said before, it can only uh, uh, co-occur with the second pass. So you have it for the present tense here, this nice little uh, scheme and for the past tense here, and it doesn't co-occur as a suffix with a uh, past two. And you can see here that the sigma indeed, the S sound uh, has some regressive assimilation on the M that precedes it. And this is, this is rather consistent uh, throughout the corpus. So the negative suffix is also constrained. I mean, there seem to be constraints on its usage. So, so you, uh, we told you that you can only use it with the second past, um, but uh, in, in uh, main, uh, in main in declarative main clauses, it is also always marked with the focus marker law. And we'll talk more tomorrow about why this is the case. Um, but it is mainly because uh, a focus marker marks new information in a sentence and a negation is always new information. So um, a negation is never something that you have already mentioned before. It's always new information to the hearer, unless you repeat the same negation, obviously. Uh, and uh, uh, therefore it's always marked with this focus marker. Um, moreover, there seems to be also a correlation between the presence of a negation, uh, ne negative suffix and subject clitic. And so this is quite interesting because there's also a correlation between the presence of a past two and a subject clitic. So there seems to be this little triangle of past two negative and subject clitic that like to be around each other. Um, but we don't know why. Um, and so here we have an example. Uh, I did not consume. Oh, oh, what happened? I here. Um, I did not conceal from you any word which you asked me. Um, I did not conceal. That's our main verb here. Um, you see, it is marked with the predicate marker, which has merged with the subject lytic. So we get this a. Eh. Uh, we have a past tense, a second past. Um, and our negation marker right here. I did not conceal from you. Uh, from you is right here with a locative. And then our, um, uh, our uh, uh, um, object is this entire thing. Uh, any word, uh, sorry, this entire thing. Any word which you asked me. And so with this uh, relative clause inside and the whole, the whole thing here marked with the accusative, uh, it being the direct object. Um, then you have a few more of these um, uh, uh, forms like a yusiv with ma and unka, um, let's. Um, they're not very frequent, but they appear sometimes. Um, and they're vetatives, uh, which basically mean don't, don't do this, don't do that. Um, again, here you see it with the old subject lyrics and very nicely this ta. Um, now before Alexandro says, hey, is that not the ta of perfective? Um, it is not, or at least it would be very weird if it is, um, because uh, this ta occurs in negations and it seems to be an alternative negative suffix. Um, it also co-occurs in several, with several other verbs. Um, it seems to be lexically selected. Um, so maybe this is actually an older negation than the negation with min. And the reason I'm saying that is because again, this min is very clearly an incorporated verb because it's the copula plus negative suffix min. Um, so if this is an incorporated verb and this doesn't look at all like a verb, then maybe this is an older thing. Moreover, this negation suffix appears in forms that are less frequently used, forms that also have retained um, the, the old subject lytics. So there is this 
I have this hunch that this may be the older one. Uh, and it's also the one that's disappearing. The question is then, of course, what does it relate to? Can we find morphemes in other Nubian languages or other North and East Sudanic languages that have kept this specific form of negation? Uh, I don't know yet, but I would really like to find out. Or maybe Meritic has a negation with T. Um, that, that would be fun. Uh, I, I don't think people have found Meritic negations yet. So. Uh, Plurectionality, and I have to move a bit quickly through this. Is there is there is there something else after this, Dima? Okay, so I I have a little bit of I have a little bit of time uh, 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 because I really don't think I'm going to make it today. Um, um, so uh, a plurectional a plurectionality is also sometimes called verbal number, and uh, it encodes on the verb the plurality of uh, one or uh, one of the uh, roles that the verb um, uh, assigns. So when you have this prolectional marker J used on an intransitive verb, it usually marks a plural subject. When it's on a transitive verb, it usually marks a plural direct object. When it's on a ditransitive verb, it usually marks a plural indirect object, if that indeed is accusative marked. And sometimes it uh, 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 relates a plural event. Um, that is the that is the solution when none of these other uh, solutions work. Basically, uh, it's like the default is like okay, it doesn't seem to relate to either my subject, object, or indirect object because all of these are clearly singular. So it must be a plural event. Um, Again, this is something that is well attested in other Nubian languages and in other Nile Saharan languages. So uh, uh, this is a, a known thing to exist and it also still exists in current now Nubian languages in, in several forms, there are ways to mark verbal number with J or with ir and so on. So, so there are a bunch of these suffixes that exist. Um, I did this whole spiel. I'm not sure if I really should go deep into this because I made all these really funky uh, uh, constructed examples to show you that you know the the the, the plurectional suffix always refers to an accusative marked object, but not to a dative marked one. So, in this case, we have the boatsman gives the book to the church. Right, book church are both singular, no plurectional suffix. Um, then we have the sentence um, where we have a plurectional suffix on the verb um, and our indirect object is in the dative. In that case, this thing refers to the object because the object is in the accusative and this one is in the dative. That also means that you don't necessarily need plural marking on your object anymore, right? Because the plurality is already marked here. So this is one of the cases in which you can drop the goo. Um, then we have uh, uh, gives to the churches. So, okay, so in this case, we don't find a plurational marker on your verb, um, which means that my accusative marked object is singular, which it clearly looks singular, um, even though my indirect object marked with a dative is plural, we still don't find it, right? So there's no correlation between the plurality of this thing here, because it's dative marked and the verb. Um, then if we have, a, we keep this plural, but then also make this plural, then again, we get our directional marker here. And then finally, um, when we have an accusative marked indirect object, namely the indirect object is animate, which is nearly always the case, right? I think that the word, Church is literally the only inanimate things to which anything is ever given in an old Nubian text, which tells you something about these texts. Um, um, then if the indirect object is marked with the accusative, as in this case, my friends, um, then the production marker always refers to that. So the interpretation of this sentence can never be the boatsman gives the books to his friends. This is singular. And if this is actually plural, you need plural marking here because this thing on the verb here refers by default to friends, his friends. By the way, a genitive marking is missing here. That's my mistake. Now, um, 
then we move on to valency. So valency, um, valency margin services do something with, you know, adding or subtracting or subtracting a row from your verb. So, you know, when you have an intransitive verb, you can make a transitive. When you have a transitive verb, you can make a ditransitive. Or when you have a transitive verb, you can make it intransitive. So you can add and subtract, basically. That's your plus and minus signs. That's what these things are. Um, that's, of course, the easy story. Uh, in reality, these suffixes behave in ways that are, especially these two, that are not completely, you know, so clear cut. Um, also because this transitive suffix originally used to be a causative. So sometimes these verbs get a causative feel to them. This causative, for whatever reason, I don't really understand, seems to influence also the, 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 the meaning of the verb it attaches to. So it introduces like this weird passive-like meaning to it. Um, the, the passive itself is kind of straightforward though. So this, this one is not, is not causing any problems. Um, but to give you some examples here, um, uh, the cross overthrows the altars. We have here the verb urp to fall. And then with a transitive marker, it becomes to overthrow. So is this, is, it sounds a bit more causative, right? To cause to fall or, you know, something like that. So let's just call it transitive or I just call it transitive because we need to distinguish it from the next one, uh, which is the causative uh, clearly. Um, and so God will cause his soul to be thoroughly examined in hell. Um, we have here to examine it's even, uh, uh, pudgy, uh, pudgy, pudgy, um, or budgie budge, sorry. Um, to examine thoroughly, like to examine multiple times and very, uh, intensively. That's how you use this, um, reduplication. And then with our causative suffix uh, here. So what I mean with there is this passive flavor to it is that um, it seems to say that um, so his soul or his heart, it is quite interesting that in, in Old Nubian the word for soul and heart are one and the same word. Um, his soul um, is caused to be examined right? So there is this flip in, in the verb where it's not, you know, you're not causing someone to examine something else, but you're causing something to be examined. Um, and all of that in a single suffix. So this is, this is very, quite interesting. What is even more surprising is that you also have a causative auxiliary and that causative auxiliary is a true causative. Whereas this one seems to be like more like a causative passive or something. Um, so as a suffix, it does that, but not as an auxiliary. Um, uh, fun. Um, then the passive works like a passive in English. Um, if, if actually English would have a proper passive morpheme. Um, so, but when he saw the offspring of man conquered, conquered by the baseness of the devil. Um, so we have a verb to conquer and then the passive is to be conquered. And then as, um, as is usual, the agent of the action, so in this case, uh, uh, the baseness of the devil, Diabolos in Mirtlo, um, is, uh, is marked with a, in this case, a postposition, right? So June by. Um, we arrive at auxiliaries and modal verbs. This is like, there is still so much to say about this, but I'm going to keep it very short. You have a bunch of auxiliaries. There are all kinds of conditions in which these auxiliaries appear and they're not at all very clear. Um, it also seems to be one of these dead ends. Like sometimes a language develops a whole bunch of features. And then at the end of the day, it's like, nah, you know, this really doesn't work. I'm going to throw them all out. Auxiliaries are one of these things. Um, they are not, they didn't really become a thing. So it's like most of these occur once or twice or like, you know, this popular auxiliary, it's like, you know, what, what is this even, what, what is this for? So um, uh, the causative auxiliary stopped appearing. It just, we're like, we already have a suffix. We don't need an auxiliary for this, you know, the same for this negative auxiliary. We, we already have the suffix. Why would we need this auxiliary? Um, but they occur in the wild. Um, and so, oh, um, can I? Oh no. Okay. I don't understand why there are no more examples. Okay. Here. Um, 
So here we see uh, a, a very rare occurrence of the progressive auxiliary. Um, the temple of their judgments was ascending up to uh, eternity. So it's something that is in progress. Um, and what, what, what shows you is that something is an auxiliary construction is that both the auxiliary and the content verb are marked with uh, a tense marking. So, right, so we have an auxiliary marked with past one, but then our content verb or the, the verb that actually gives the meaning to the construction is marked with present, which seems to be some type of default present. Um, even though you could also have a past tense marker here and it would mean the same thing, technically speaking. So we don't really understand why that is or how that works. Um, but what's important is that in auxiliary construction, both verbal roots carry tense marking. That is the, that is the distinctive, distinctive character of these constructions because if it had no tense marking, then this would simply be a converb, right? Uh, and share everything with whatever verb is right here. But it is not a converb because it has this tense marking on it. So that's, that's the crucial distinction. Um, then we have some modal verbs. Again, we need to do much more research on these, but it would be great if we have a bunch of more text in order to do so because they're not so frequent. Um, we have the verb can, want, need, and not want. Um, and they either go with an infinitive, which only appears in these contexts. And, you know, I think it's an infinitive, but, you know, maybe it's just a verb with nothing because many things end in E simply because for phonological reasons. Um, but when they have a complement clause is with an accusative, which is something that is like typologically also kind of common, um, then we can clearly see what's going on. So that's why I gave you one of those. Um, thus, no one can count the number of holy ones whom the angel saved. Um, the verb that we need to look at is uh, the main verb. No one can count, um, cannot count in this case. So we have our modal verb here with a negative. And so the verb can is one of these verbs that also takes a negative in ta, always does. Um, notice also that when it does so, there is no person marking on it. There is, you know, no tense marking on it. Um, there is only this focus marker. So this is already, you know, like, what is this form? Is this an ancient form? Is this like, is this older than this form? Like in terms of its you know, morphological makeup or order, or is this like fossilized or what's going on? Um, in any case, uh, we see that it takes a complement clause, um, can count uh, the number of holy ones. Um, and here we have our, uh, the, the verb of the complement clause to count. Um, notice also that the object of to count is this entire thing which, uh, sorry, this entire thing, uh, this whole long thing, um, which for uh, probably uh, uh, phonological reasons comes at the very end. So we won't really talk about this, but it seems to be that in Old Nubian heavy phrases, such as phrases with uh, a relative clause in it, can uh, be extraposed at the end of the clause after your main verb. And this seems to be quite a frequent thing. Uh, and, and that's also what's happening here. And then the wild thing is, is that in this case, then it seems that the antecedent of the relative clause has then moved to the front of it. So I, uh, there's all kinds of like, because we have this, this emphatic marker. So like there's all kinds of movement and weird syntactic shit happening in this sentence. But the takeaway is complement clause with accusative case. And here's our model verb. Um, and I think then that's it. And we actually, it's eight o'clock, but I would do like to have some time for questions. Uh, don't want to make it too long, but if there are any questions, you can ask them in the chat. I'm sorry, I really poured an enormous amount of information over you. Um, this, this was the worst. Like we were, you know, tomorrow is going to be a chill ride. Like subordination, it's easy. Topic focus, it's easy. Like maybe we'll look at the text or something, but we're not, we're, you know, it won't be like super information heavy. Um, but if there's any questions um, or confusions that I can help clarify, then I would be more than happy to, to do so now. Um, let's see. Oh, could it be something like God will have someone else thoroughly examined? Ah, uh, yeah. Okay. Um, let's see. It's about, yeah, this causative thing. 
I'm sorry I was not very clear about that, but it's because it's not very clear in my head. Um, so the question is, uh, Gopal asks, can the translation of this sentence not be something like God will have someone else thoroughly examine your heart? Um, yes, of course it can be that. The problem is, is that that is kind of a hidden passive, right? So uh, uh, because you do not, because the subject is under specified. So you're basically displacing the problem to then who is this someone and why is that someone not expressed um, explicitly in the sentence, right? So you, you so yes, it is maybe passive, causative passive is not the right word, but the problem is, is that there is a role missing in the sentence that's not expressed. And so whether you call that it's passive-like as in your soul is examined, or you say someone will examine your soul, the problem remains is why is that that, that role, uh, uh, like the causey, let's say, the one who is caused to examine, um, not expressed. Uh, because that's precisely the thing that you would want to have when you have a causative, right? You want to cause someone else to do something and you want that someone else, I mean, that's information that you would want to convey. And there's nothing in the context of this sentence, uh, which comes from the canons, uh, Nicene, pseudo Nicene canons, that would tell us who this someone is. Uh, imp implied would probably be the devil, but the devil is not really mentioned before or after. So, so, um, maybe it could work in this example, but there are other examples in which you're like, okay, but, but why, you know, why exactly is this happening? So, okay, that makes sense. Great. Because then it also makes sense to me. Um, Solange, um, it is interesting that I recognize a lot of words that are similar to the Egyptian, although different. So what would be the words that are the same as Egyptian? I would be, uh, I would be curious about that. Well, um, I think um, Ementa. Oh yeah, yeah, that's that, a good one. Yeah, it, that is a loan word from a Coptic, in fact. Yeah. Okay, and yeah. then arpai for temple. Yes, also a loan word from Coptic. Coptic. And then just man is negation. That's also Egyptian and less likely to be borrowed. Maybe. Yeah, and it's not. I mean, the etymology in from Nubian is clear. So it uh, that's just like a coincidence. Okay. But yeah, uh, epenta, uh, ementa, and arpai are both loan words. A big question from which stage of the Egyptian language it was borrowed. So like there is a big question about how deep these borrowings go, especially with Arpae, which doesn't seem immediately logically connected to any word for temple in any of the dialects of Coptic, uh, at least from the look of its vowels. Um, Emente is kind of fun because as far as I understand, Emente simply means underworld. Um, uh, it's in, the west. It's the blessed west where Osiris. Right. It's it's a fun it's a fun place to be. Well, in Old Numi it means hell. So right. so, <laughs> that's, so this that's religion change, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, this is really quite interesting, right? So there is there is also another word. For example, the word for people, uh, sipa, is probably a loan from the Coptic word for enemy. So uh, uh, there are oh, a few cool. of these very nice. Uh, and so also, for example, the word for temple, this arpae. That is obviously a pagan temple that needs to be destroyed, right? So, like, there are all these very nice, uh, like, you know, what is nice for you is not so nice for me uh, relations. So, in the old Nubian, the Arpai is a, it has a negative connotation. Yeah, it's not a temple for the Christian oh. God. It's a temple of the pagans that needs to be destroyed by the by the glorious cross. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. Um, so, wait, uh, let's see. Um, um, Lamine sometimes changed the interpretation of the verb to passive. What happens the rest of the time? So it's again about this causative. The rest of the time, it's just a simple causative, um, actually. And so, yeah, what can I say? It doesn't do anything else really weird, uh, except that phonologically, it's in one text, it's very weird. But yeah, it's that's supposedly an old text. Um, so, so asks, oh, there are a lot of questions today. So asks, does Old Nubian have noun incorporation? Um, so noun incorporation is a phenomenon in which uh, you usually have a transitive verb and then its object is really close and the object is usually marked with the accusative. And then at some point in time, the accusative is dropped and, and the, 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 the noun basically merges into the verb phonologically. 
um, does Old Nubian do that? I mean, many SOV languages do this, and Old Nubian does so too. Not very frequently, though. But there is now an incorporation in Old Nubian, especially in certain what it seems to be like lexically frequent uh, environments, like uh, with the verb to have, for example, you can do now an incorporation, you, you, which basically means you drop the accusative case on the object if it is adjacent to the verb. So yeah, you can do that, but it's not it's not very productive. Right. Uh, thanks. Um, Vince, is it the case that Oduvian borrows from Egyptian and Greek, especially for theological language? Um, so it borrows from Greek only Christian terms, basically. Uh, uh, so it appears that the loans from Greek really come with the Christian religion, um, which makes it very unlike Coptic, right? Coptic is like, I don't know, how many percent, I mean, so probably knows, like how much percent Greek? But its its vocabulary is like completely uh, filled with with Greek on in every single word class and and uh, uh, a level. In Old Nubian, it's really constrained to the sphere of religion. Um, when it comes to Coptic loanword, it's less clear uh, uh, there because there are only a few. So uh, funnily enough, we saw a couple of them today in the examples, but they're not more than six or seven or something. Right, so is the word for hell. There's this word for temple, which only appears once or twice. Um, there is a, the word for for people, which is maybe a loan word, not very clear. There's the word for wine, orb. So this is very clear uh, as a loan word, um, and maybe maybe a word for 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 some plants or something, but like not you know nothing really uh, really substantial. Yeah. Um, and then Asma says it is common to borrow. Yeah, so so Asma says that in fact in Nobin, uh, a lot of religious terms are borrowed from Arabic. Well, again, that makes sense, right? So you get a new religion, you borrow the words. Uh, 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 um, interestingly, however, is what I understand is that in in Nobin, the word kora or kora is still used for uh, for eight. Uh, um, and this is a really wonderful, right? So you have this uh, uh, you have this Nubian word, which is first used in a Christian context for the Holy Sacrament, and then is used in an Arabic con in an Islamic context for the Fitr al um, uh, um, And I see this uh, still in, in wishes on Twitter and so on when it's when it's the eight uh, festivities, people wish wish each other a nice kore, um, which which is really nice because that word clearly comes also com comes from pre-Christian religion, right? And it somehow has endured through at least a minimum of three religions to mean a celebratory feast, right? Be that, you know, eating the, the body of God or celebrating, you know, the end of Ramadan. So, so this is, I think it's a very nice, um, uh, a very nice exception to the, to the, uh, to the uh, tradition to loan words uh, for a new religion. Of course, it would be very interesting to know what words persist in the language from the pre-Christian religion, right? So, uh, as C. Solange, of course, as like I would like to know too. What is interesting is that the words that are loaned in the realm of uh, statementship and statecraft seem to be uh, 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 pre-Nubian. So, like, not it's it's there are pre-Nubian loans in the sense that they are uh, clearly not. Uh, phonologically structured like other Nubian words. So they seem to be loan words, like words like songoj for eparch or a whole bunch of official titles like nash and ikshil and all like very, let's say, non Nubian phonology. Um, they most certainly are loan words. But the question is from what and can we find parallels in, for example, Meroitic, which would be a logical place to look. And so uh, we're looking, uh, <laughs> uh, but we haven't found anything yet. All right, so are there any questions, Dima, from Facebook? No, Dima shakes her head. Well, in that case, um, I bid you good night. And thank you everyone again for uh, tuning in today. And tomorrow we have the last class and um, then um, you all have your virtual certificates, I suppose. All right, thank you so much and hope to see you tomorrow.